you're going to be building and leading a team and kind of ahead of that, you want to kind of set up a framework in terms of, you know, culture, values, approach, processes, that kind of thing to, to help establish that for, for your team. Yes, yes right? exactly. And I do have um, also have a background thought behind like the, what are these principles on what we try to achieve. Yep. So in that context, it's a free-to-play mobile game, so very competitive market yep. where we cannot experiment for five years and see what happens. So we need yep. to experiment to type past. What does that mean then in terms of way of working? Where also, what are we experimenting on? What are we trying? How do we make it uh, more rigorous? We are not just experimenting randomly things. So right. I also do framework based also on the goals we are um, trying to achieve in a window of a year, you know, and then and beyond. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The point being that we are in such a highly competitive industry that any team that you're a part of has to be extremely operationally efficient and effective. And so being able to have a structure, a process, a framework so that, you know, you're driving these these efficiencies sounds like, a, you know, very important, very important goal and objective for a, a team leader such as yourself. How important is culture to the success of a game team? And what are specific principles and values that will enable game teams to dramatically increase the likelihood of successful project outcomes? I've spoken about some of these issues in previous videos, and I will also include a link to my own presentation on business values that I believe in in the YouTube show notes. But today we will be speaking to Sophie Vo who will talk about her own set of principles and values that she will use in building a new game team when she joins her new company, Voodoo, in the next few weeks. I personally believe that culture is critically important to success, and so I'm really excited and happy to be talking to Sophie about her own thoughts on these issues in more detail. And so Sophie is going to talk about, first, who, who is she? What is her background? Secondly, why does she think documenting and establishing culture is so important. And finally, we're going to go ahead and jump into her presentation and her thoughts on specific values and culture that she believes in. And so with that, let's take it to Sophie right now. In my background, I've been all my career uh, in games, but uh, more specifically in mobile games. Mm -hmm. So I've been 10 years um, in the industry. And I started actually working uh, back in the days at Gameloft in not even what we call today free-to-play, but premium Java yeah. for games. Yeah. So it was really fun. But yeah. uh, my experience, my background has been more producer and then uh, slowly moving towards more uh, product management as free-to-play became the dominating uh, business model for uh, mobile. So then I, I joined Wuga in Berlin and uh, leading um, the uh, hit games of Wuga, Diamond Dash, and Jelly Sprax, so as well working um, more specifically on casual games, and that's what I enjoy uh, doing. And then at Rovio, um, where it's also is the foundation now of my work, uh, where I built uh, from the beginning um, a team and also a game that is uh, currently in, uh, in soft launch uh, from Rovio in Reverse Pop 2. And I used a lot of that work for the next team I will build uh, for Voodoo. So, um, yeah, talking more about that part. Um, I'm tasked uh, for the next uh, venture to build a team in Berlin, but not for a hyper casual game. Oh. It, will be, it will be to be defined. Okay. Um, it will be casual, but now these days, you know, the range of casual is very broad. So, yes. with casual midcore, will be casual, like super casual. So, something between hyper casual and casual. Um, how would it look like? This is to be defined with a team and based also on what Voodoo is the best at, but I will see when I start with them. And that's also why I would like us as a team to focus more on the game we will do and less on the uh, processes and uh, figuring out how we should work together because based on my experience, I know what is the best way to get there. And I want to leave also a lot of ownership for the team, but that means as well implies that they need to have the right tools to be able to make the right decision if I want us to work as an um, autonomous team. Yes, so um, for the situation I have uh, next, um, building a team in uh, Berlin mm -hmm. uh, with Vodou. Uh, basically, I'm starting from the ground up, like 
there's uh, nothing established. So uh, based on my experience as well in the past, um, building teams, I inherited a lot of teams. Um, and when you inherit a team, then people have certain expectation of how things are running based on the previous teams or based on their previous organization. Right. And most of the time I find out about this uh, misalignment through clashes. So it happens, you know, by the situation and uh, what I wanted to do then with a, through that handbook and um, this a set of principles was to discuss and use it as a tool of communication with the team, the new team that I will form. Um, what do we stand uh, behind in terms of design decisions or um, area of responsibilities or uh, how do we give feedback to each other? How do we reflect on what we have done? Uh, how do we learn from our mistakes? And uh, as I said, by experience, I know that we, these are implied rules and by not talking about it, we find out by accidents and opportunities sometimes, but we were not so aligned. So sure. I, I want to make it more efficient, effective this time by creating as a, um, from the ground that set of uh, principles and it's more a starting point for discussion with the team and the people who join me rather than okay this is it and we won't change it so i expect it to be living as well as we work together as a team okay i'm back so stay tuned folks sophie's about to jump into her presentation and you definitely want to hang on to see if there's anything that you can apply to your own specific team but there are a few issues that sophie mentioned that i think we should talk about the first is the potential for misalignment and so if individuals on the team are not aligned, then there's definitely this potential for conflict. And in fact, uh, there's a great quote by Ray Dalio in his book, Principles. And I wanted to mention that uh, today. And he states, there are all kinds of different people in the world, many of whom value different things. A lack of common values will lead to a lot of pain and other harmful consequences and may ultimately drive you apart it might be better to head all that off as soon as you see it coming. And so for those of you who haven't read Principles by Ray Dalio, definitely recommend it. But again, talking about this potential for conflict, if there is that misalignment in terms of values with people in terms of the organization and an individual or different individuals on the same team. Sophie then talked about three important points that I think are important to highlight. The first is that there is a document, right? And so you know, in terms of whether it's the values, the operating procedures, the rules of the team, that it's written down somewhere and that it, there's, there's a document there as a basis for discussion. Secondly, that this document is just actually a starting point for further discussion. Every team is different. And so finding out what those values, operating procedures, rules are for your team, it's gonna be specific to every single team. And so having that document is great and then having this discussion around what's right for a specific team. And finally, that it is a living document, that these operating procedures, values, rules are continuously refined and improved upon is very important to make sure that the team is continuously getting better. And so with that, let's jump into Sophie's presentation right now. Let's start here. Okay. So that, uh, that is the handbook I've been working on. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, I, I spent some time also on like how to uh, frame and name that uh, guide because while I could call it uh, principles, it can sound a bit intimidating and we are still working in games. And while it's very common in tech companies like Netflix have their principle, yeah. uh, big organization, Google, Amazon, I wanted to make it more friendly. So I came up with DNA. So it's mm -hmm. also what makes as a team or DNA, but I translated it into do not assume handbook. Right. Because uh, basically, I want to make the uh, implicit rules of working more explicit. And that's uh, what is uh, coming out of that handbook. And um, I'll walk uh, you through it. Processes are very often foggy and they are assumed rather than being explicitly communicated in a team. And by my experience, I've seen that as well. It leads to misunderstanding, frustration, and ineffectiveness. So I don't want to leave it to chance or guess. And I want to use that handbook as a tool of communication with the team because our goal as a team forming, we want to deliver the best game experience for our players. Right. And then um, maybe I could interrupt you a little bit because I, I think that this is a very good point that you raise here about processes often being foggy and assumed. 
And why do you think in so many com- companies and in a, in a lot of teams that the processes are so vague or not clearly defined and not well communicated? Because y- y- we see this over and over in so many game teams, but, but what do you think is the cause of that? So uh, I see <clears throat> um, several factors. The first one is that um, processes are moving so fast with a type of games markets moving. Yeah. Uh, so they are moving all the time and the ones that used to be um, valid or relevant are not anymore. So they are changing faster than we actually are aware about them. Right. So that's uh, one reason. The second is more no one likes to talk about processes. So it <laughs> makes it sound very formal. So no one's I've, I've witnessed it. No one wants to take the responsibility to be in charge of that and talking like, okay, look, guys, we have a certain set of rules and principles that will make our work more effective. This is not fun to do, but right. this, this will make our work better. So having also clear people responsible of making it happen is something I've seen as well as a cause. And I would say um, one of her is that there's a, a confusion by... Uh, saying these days we have lean teams, uh, teams that have ownership, autonomy. And uh, it's confused with let's give them all the freedom they want and (laughs) let's do whatever we want. And then we, I've seen companies as well, like using that model to leave a team very autonomous, a lot of freedom. I have had that at Ruga, at Rovio to some extent, uh, in experimenting new games, but with no guidance, it leads to games that don't lead to anywhere. And after a year of checking, nothing has happened, it's not working. Right. So that's also another reason. Um, yes, freedom, uh, ownership is great, but you need also to give the tools and the responsibility for teams to be acting with that freedom. Yeah, I, I think from my own experience, it seems like a couple, of, a couple of things. One is that processes are often not well documented. And then if they are, it's like scattered across multiple, like, you know, somebody creates a PowerPoint, somebody creates like a Word doc, somebody, and then, and then it's like not in all one place. So then the processes are just scattered across multiple random files all over. And then the people who come up with the processes are oftentimes not the best in terms of implementing the process. So there's like this difference between designing the process and implementing the process. And a lot of people are might be great at designing a process, but then they're like, okay, I came up with the process. And it's like, well, why is nobody following the process? Because they're they're terrible at then actually communicating it out, getting everyone together, explaining it, and then following up. And so that like the execution of the process, I, I often think is like 10 times harder than designing the process. But anyway, yeah, not to go off point. on a tangent, but yeah, that's a very good point, actually, as well. Like working documenting the process but if it's not lived through or iterated like a product basically um yeah. it, it just stays on on you know on the document so uh tying it with how to incorporate it with also the workflows and the way of working of the team that's the right. whole challenge okay and not to mention also each team have their own way so this is where it becomes even more complicated <laughs> um, yeah. yeah and it comes actually to my other point um it's a reality these days that teams are very diverse um, diverse in um, culture, background, um, very international from where they have worked, what they have seen. So everybody comes with a certain mindset of how things should be done. Yeah. And by not talking about it, this is where I see the clash. So we, we assume that we kind of work the same way because we work in the same industry, but most of the time we don't. Uh-huh. And I've, I found out the hard way when I see the result on a design or a feature and like tracking back what has happened is like, okay, now I see that we have never been aligned on how we should get to the result of designing or choosing an idea. A hundred percent agree with you on this. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I wanted make, to make it like, again, like it's a known thing. We know that we are coming from different places and I don't expect anyone to be uh, figuring it out from the beginning. So I won't talk about it and make it like deliberate rather than accidental. So yeah, I have, uh, then I broke down a bit that uh, uh, handbook in different topics. So first one being about the design, because there are so many things to talk around that. And uh, if, what's behind is not more um, how to design a good game, but more how do we make decision on what we design, what we choose to explore and what not to do. 
because that is the main challenge of when you have a bad blank page and as a team you are assigned, okay, you can make a new game, where to start, you know? So mm -hmm. I want to give a bit more guidance, a box uh, as a team of what we should do and what we should not do. Also, it's aligned with the goals of um, of uh, Vodou, of thinking big, so, like envisioning something big. So that is also the main data as a team. We won't go for a small niche uh, game, for example. We want to make something new that can reach out a lot of people and also that brings the new experience. So that is the mandate from the beginning. So that also gives a certain box for uh, the team and designers to think of. And what does that mean here? So I go more in details, okay. a, lot, a big audience, millions of players. Um, and also we as a team, we believe that we are the best qualified to deliver that experience, whatever we have envisioned. So I'm not going to go tomorrow, for example, for a mid-core game where I have not a lot of experience and maybe not a lot of interest. So I, I wouldn't um, claim myself to be the best competent to do that. Um, so thinking more what we like to do and what we think we could be the best to deliver. And uh, thinking also of scales and automation. So it's um, a point also on, uh, behind the tech. So when we design things, how can we make it live long and not uh, just for a year, but how can we maintain and automate most part of it and scale? For yeah, I, and I, I noticed in particular with Voodoo on the on the on the marketing UA side, I've, I've seen quite a bit of of machine learning and automation. So uh, yeah, I, I can definitely see that there's there's a lot of technology investment in, in the company you're going to be going to. Yeah, and that is to be built, I would say, for the new series of games we will be making. But I keep in mind that what has been the framework on the things they have done in the past, you apply as well on the next series of games. Right. And uh, the other also topic that also I've, I've uh, suffered from is the risk and innovation. Mm -hmm. So go, because it's a very um, tempting thing to do when we have to innovate, but we innovate on everything. And I learned that also the hard way when I was working on my previous game. Uh, that we, I, we went too far as a team on innovating on a lot of parts and we could have spent three to five years to figure it out. Yeah. And at some point, uh, the management expects you to deliver. So yes. it is also something aligned with what are the expectation of management. If we are expected to deliver in a one, two year in the market, let's say here one year, we need to choose our battle. And I want to yes. make it clear as well for the team, where do we choose to innovate and where do we choose to uh, adopt, reuse some parts of what is proven. So I want to give here a framework as well for the team, what to really identify what we want to adopt and why, because we see it's working well and we see this is not a big win to try to reinvent the wheel there, but what are the other areas where we really innovate and create some value? And I want to leave a, a, a certain part that I call more R&D experimentation, where we have no idea if it will work, but we think it's cool and we leave some space for that to discover as well something that could be big, but that's not the main thing. So leaving a part for more deliberate like innovation creation and other more crazy. Um, that's also something I, I didn't give enough space um, in my previous uh, game, and I would like to give it more space, um, but I, I will explain as well in our workflow how could that translate? So Sophie, just trying to understand the difference between innovate and explore. Could, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, what what would be like an example of like, well, I think we understand uh, innovate in, in terms of like, that would be like a, you know, that's where you're trying to come up with the plus one for a game design or the, the new features, the new thing. And then the explore part, maybe you could help me understand a little bit better what you mean by that. Yes. So um, it's exactly on the direction you have mentioned. So innovate to me, we talk about innovations this day, but what is it really? There's nothing new that is created out of nowhere. So innovation, I would take it from the angle that we see a role maybe in a game, uh, in a genre, in the market, and then we want to improve. We believe we can uh, create some value uh, yeah. improving something or you know, ex expanding uh, something on the market. So that's more the direction. So it's there's more thinking behind. Exploring, I see that more as a, in a context of a game jam, for example, or training time where uh, I think of themes, for example. Um, let's say if we wanted to take innovate on themes, I would look at the market and then I would make an assumption of what could work and then test. Right. Like on the floor, we would sit down with the team, what we think is really cool, what we are really passionate about, but we don't know if it would work. And we would test it without thinking too much about it. 
Right. So it's, now, it's like more open. Got it. And I think you made a really great point in terms of, you know, trying to understand the practical reality of what a team can accomplish in a given time frame, right? And, and so like, if you're trying to do something really innovative, really crazy, and you only have a year, I mean, that's kind of unrealistic. Mm -hmm. But then do you also think that this model would depend on kind of your situational context as well in terms of the company that you're working for? for and the time frame that you have. So like if yeah. you're a supercell, I, I would assume that, you know, I mean, they're, they're not going to be 100% innovation, but that innovative explore yeah. part might be a little bit bigger. Or if you're like Blizzard, you know, and you've got six years to make a car stone, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can yeah, kind of... Exactly. I, I see that as a tool and I hope it can um, inspire other uh, teams, depending on what is their goal, to uh, use that range, you know, depending on the goal. So exactly the companies you have mentioned, if I were, my Monday would be to create really a very new innovative game and I have like kind of a more bigger window of time, yeah. I would uh, increase the innovate part because there, it will require a lot of experimentation. Right. Um, in that case, for me, it's like more of a year window and it's also as a new team, uh, I, I believe that we need first to start launching something you know, that reasonable, that is realistic for us. And then yeah. as we get more confidence mm -hmm. that we have achieved that. Maybe even the second product could be have more innovation because we have learned how to do this. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Them. Like, you don't, you don't want to invest in a highly innovative team that's working on a concept for six years unless you're really sure about that team working together, right? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. So I want us to ship first something that is really good. Yeah. But... Uh, then we've, uh, I would say, ambition to make it innovative and top 50 or top 10 grossing. Uh, that's a lot to take uh, as a start. Yep. So starting like first with building the team and delivering, you know, a good game. Uh, that's, uh, I would say, the first mandate. Okay. For me, it's important as a team that we think about it. We don't want to spend uh, too much time deliberating too long on, you know, um, if we should do this or if we, sh we should not do it. Uh, for example, if there's some mechanics or in games, like how do we give uh, lives in a puzzle game? I don't want to spend time to, de you know, to deliberate on should we innovate on that and should we try to change it? it it's not worth it. So right. really uh, focusing and investing on time on the right things. <clears throat> and the other part, uh, also part of the design, I made it also... Uh, deliberate and pro provocatively data informed instead of data driven. We mm -hmm. talk a lot in the market these days of data driven decision, data driven companies, data driven design. And uh, the harm of, of that, I would say semantic of data driven, I've seen also in organization that it's stretched so far in design that we don't anymore know how to create. So yes. we just look at what is out there and then we rely on numbers of the past to uh, define what is the future. And because as a team, we are mandated to create something new, I don't want the team to be so boxed into that data-driven mindset. So we use data to understand the past, but we have to still to build the future. And building the future to me is making assumption what it could be and verifying with uh, data, iterating and back it up. That's how I want to use uh, data in the design, but right. not to define what we should design. So yeah, I go more into details here, but we will, we will still do the same as other teams and other organization, looking at what competitors do, do a making benchmark, using market insights, um, crossing qualitative and quantitative data. However, I don't expect us to have all the answers by just the data. So it's making, forming an assumption, an educated assumption based on the data we have. Right. And I think this is a really great point, Sophie, because I think the problem is, is that in the real world, there are just so many variables and too many ways in which experiments can, can uh, actually lead to the wrong conclusion. So anyway, yeah. I wanted to make that quick point. Yeah, yeah I, it's a more a reaction of what I see, but um, especially as designers, it's very tempting to turn more into too much PM thinking. I'm not saying it's yeah. a bad thing. But designers, we still need to create, you know. Yes. And then it, it 
cannot just come from a PM thinking it's we make assumption as a PM, but uh, we still need to create a new right, game. right, and and a game fundamentally is 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 a, a work of art, right? And so that's yeah. like there's there's both the science and the art, and they have to come yeah. together. It can't just be all science, or you're not gonna, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm sure a lot of yeah. you know games will be just made that way, just by pure science. But it's not an exact science; it's art. Yeah. Uh, it's a mix of uh, both. And uh, this is not a new point, but I want to make uh, clear as well for the team, like we are player centric. So um, I've seen that less and less in the industry that um, teams or designers still believe that they are making a game for themselves. The reality is that we are making a game for someone else. So that also affects how we verify the design, how we test uh, to make sure that we are testing with a proper audience and we have an audience in mind when we design things. So I go through here, like also, this is a work of, of us as a team to understand wh uh, what game do we make and for who, um, and also not just making it in our imagination, but knowing or getting to know somehow the players, the ones we aim for. So in my previous game, we were going like a bubble shooter. Um, it's actually 35 plus to 50, 60 um, women, can be men as well mostly based in the US, I flew there and I sat down with some players. I called some of them to understand really what, what do they get out of the game? Why are they playing? And not just observing in the numbers. I try to make sense of the numbers. And that element is really important for designers to also cross not only the quantitative data, but the qualitative, why that design works or why that design doesn't work uh, with my players. So really understanding First, who are the players and how do we interact with the game? Yeah, I, I would say the one other nuance to, to being player centric is just this notion of what is actually best for players versus what's best for like the developers. And so, you know, for example, you know, a lot of publishing organizations, they'll just dictate, well, we're going to use Unity across the board and we have to use Unity. Why? Because it's more convenient for the, for the, for the publisher or or the studio because it's easier to maintain, it's easier to transition teams, it's easier to maintain code, but then, you know, there, there is some bloat or whatever. So like from a performance per perspective and from uh, the other perspective in terms of like what would actually create a product that's actually the best experience for the player, there's that trade-off. And so from an organizational perspective, you know, thinking about if you really are completely focused on the customer or the player to be player centric, then that would certainly have very, you know, important uh, implications or ramifications in terms of your development as well and some of the technology choices and things that you make. But anyway, just wanted to add that sort of nuance to. Yeah. And it's, it's a good point. I think it's really all, all about the balance. So it's keeping in mind that it has to reach still the audience, no matter how you, you know, what is the technology behind to get there. Yeah. Uh, because I would say, you, you can have a great tech, uh, but if uh, there's no one playing your game, you just don't have a game. Yeah. So I, I would rather have maybe uh, then players behind the game and not maybe the best tech, uh, but at least we have an experience that makes sense for a group of players. Yep. But it, yeah. You know, I, I would I would even bring up one other example of of you know of, of a company struggling to understand the balance between between you know, their employees in the studio versus the product, right? which is uh, Apex Legends. And so one of the things that Respawn has announced is that they're, they're, going to come, they're, they're going to deliver a live ops schedule that is consistent with their, with their company policy around work-life balance. And they're not gonna try to, to deliver a live ops experience, which the players are all claiming for, hey, we want more we want more live ups, uh, updates and things like that. And so it, it is a difficult discussion, right? So do we, if the organization is player centric, that means that you would figure out a way to deliver the content at a cadence that the customers mm -hmm. want, but then that comes at a cost to your employees and, and, and to your organization. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely a very difficult uh, sort of um, situation at, at times. Yeah. I would say, if, uh, at least for that part uh, where I stand with the player-centric, it's more to help on the design decision. 
Okay. But uh, building the whole product and the whole operations just for the players, yeah, can can lead to some undesired situation where yeah, you are just like on the treadmill, like just to deliver content. <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, like, what are, what are you trying to achieve? And uh, deep listening is like I take that from uh, Jesse Shell um, on the de game design, but basically we as a team need to listen. Uh, and we will the reality of making a game and a design product. There's a lot of uh, feedback coming from different places, and we have to hear all of them and know how to handle it and how to balance it and how what how to transform it. So that is just a reminder about uh, what I would expect from the team to have these qualities of listening and uh, the why behind the feedback. And um, yeah, a part about ideation and iteration, um, I wanted to just to have that equation here uh, to say that we, have, we make better decisions, better ideas, better iteration when we are several people um, challenging the ideas rather than one. Um, so uh, that also coming from my experience where <clears throat> I've seen also situation where to go fast, designer can just come up with the final ID, this is it, let's do it, and then we implement and then we see the feature is not working as intended and then we track back, it's like, what has happened? Because the ID was never challenged. Maybe it was missing the input of the developer to say, well, that won't scale easily, or are we sure about the UX of that feature? Um, will people will already understand? So it's not question at the right stage. So I want for anyone who comes up with ID, it could be artists, could be designers, um, even developer, when they come up with an ID, I want it to go through a certain uh, workflow that you know why this is the best idea and you are capable of ex explaining to the rest of the team why. I had also a hard discussion with designers, like why do I have to justify my work and why I should present uh, this is the best idea. Well, you should trust me as a designer. I know what I'm doing. But this is not about questioning the ability of the person. But if you don't challenge the idea, you don't make it evolve. The first idea is never the best one. So I, I want designers to be open as well to present their work and to really push themselves to not just fall in love, jump on the first idea, but really look, are there several ideas? Are there, what are the pros and cons? And also submitting that idea to critical feedback. Right. And I think this really speaks to like the culture and the values of an organization, right? Because in, in certain organizations, this, you know, and so for me, fundamentally, I 100% agree with you that discussion and debate always, in my opinion, leads to better outcomes. But certainly there are some organizations where, you know, it's like, well, let's not, let's not debate this. We just need to make a decision. Let's just go. Or yeah, to your point, just trust me. I, 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 I looked at this, but yeah, it really is very important that, you know, um, depending on the type of organization you are and depending on the values and culture of that organization, whether you do have this environment where people are, people aren't as defensive and where you can have an environment where you can discuss and debate issues. So, yeah, I, I think it's definitely a great point. And uh, what uh, you have mentioned is not everyone enjoys working like that and not yes. everyone can. So that also defines the type of uh, mindset I'm, I'm also looking for. I've worked yeah. with people who are really embracing it, so I know it exists and it has been uh, going great, but it's part also of a profile I will be looking for because it takes a certain way of thinking to accept to yeah. work as is. And um, yeah, then here as well, I value a lot brainstorming session. I still think there's not many, um, enough of them. So here as well, I give a bit of like, uh, I would say tips, hints of what I would expect from a brainstorming and how to conduct them because I've seen so bad brainstorming <laughs> sessions where it's a waste of time or everybody throws idea and we, no, no actionable, we don't know what to do with it. And then we go back to our desk and nothing has happened. So I want yeah. to make good use of our time. And uh, yeah, after the um, ideation iteration, it's like just testing. So I have also a um, mindset of testing fast. So once we have set on an idea, then we prototype like as fast as possible. And I uh, also look for um, uh, people who want to hack fast or borrow fast, you know, and fake. I believe a lot as well of not having prototype, um, prototype with no code and it works really well. I prototyped some UI. It was just a clickable, um, like we did with the principal. 
um, and presenting it to some players and testing it through a clickable prototype, super easy, I can do it myself or some paper. So there's a lot we can prototype. So I want us to have that mindset and testing fast the ideas. And yeah. So now I'm come uh, to the part of the team and feedback. Uh, so while on the design, I was focusing more on like the product. Uh, here, I've seen also in practice, um, well, in an organization, we talk a lot about, okay, let's work together as a team and give feedback to each other, it's important. But in reality, it's really difficult, very uncomfortable to give feedback. People don't like to give feedback. Mm -hmm. And the thing I found out is because they don't know how to give feedback as well. So I want to make it uh, train and coach the team to make it easier for everyone to do that. So first, it's about the awareness, why it's important peer feedback. We as a team, if we're interested in getting better, delivering the best game experience, we have to improve all the time. And it starts by awareness. And to be aware of what to improve, we up here are here to help you improve. So it's, it comes from a genuine intent of wanting to help your peers. And then how to give feedback. So I start, of course, with the positive. It's really important as well to praise about the good work. Uh, it sounds obvious, but uh, it's not a given to acknowledge when somebody did a good work. And it's not about saying, hey, you're an awesome person. But that day when you, know, you ran that brainstorming session and we had this amazing idea, you did a great work. So it's a, about praising the work and not just the person. So how to give a good praise. And that's never too much. So I want also to um, encourage that in the team that we give praise to each other when there were good things done and in time, not a month later, you know, or at a yearly review. And then the hardest part is feedback for improvement. So <clears throat> it's also coming from my experience. And I've practiced that a lot with my previous team. But when it's about team things, I believe you can share feedback uh, in front of others. So I've seen that sometimes happening uh, in Slack, in meetings, in discussion, where, for example, some ideas are not like refined, like, hey, can we um, iterate further on that idea? Yeah, and that happens in a Slack or in a meeting. So I'm fine with that. However, when it becomes individual, so from a person to a person, I recommend to people in the team to take that privately because this is more a relation to one person to one person and these are the hard feedback to give as well when they are more on an individual level. So here I give also a bit of a tips like how to make that happen, how to schedule the one-on-one -on -one with somebody, how to start even the discussion and um, when to give the feedback. So I'm not a big believer of uh, yearly or, or you know, six months review. So it's good to look at your past performance and in a big level how you have developed, but no one remembers of a task you have done five months ago. So I believe more to help each other improve. When we see something, we act immediately on it. We talk about it. And usually I do that also as a leader uh, to give you an example that it's something easy to practice you see something, you talk, just talk about it on the same day or the day after. And you don't have to make a big deal of it. But this is how people remember, and it's concrete and specific. And here is more like also um, uh, how to do, deliver constructive feedback in a one-on-one. -on -one. So we're describing the context, when it has happened, and something I've seen also, so I've learned a lot about uh, communication in trainings. Something that goes wrong in discussion is when you start to uh, point somebody and say you. So that day when we had a design discussion uh, debate, um, you were wrong or you were very taking all the attention. So that, that kind of discussion never goes well. Mm -hmm. So it's always better to start um, with when you were taking all the discussion, I didn't have a chance to express myself, my ideas. So always starting from your own emotions, your own experience, to help the other person to empathize what was the problem. Because it's never a problem about the person, but more the interaction of two people. So giving tips here as well, how to bring up a problem and not uh, coming from a judgment, but more coming from a situation. And then working together to solve that problem instead of making it the problem of another one. Do you have a, a you know, in terms of giving constructive, or in, in terms of giving feedback, 
there's that there's the concept of the shit shit sandwich, which is you know you deliver the positive, then the feedback, then another positive. Do you have any uh, opinions on 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 that? I have used it at in some occasions, but I didn't feel right about it because it's such a known technique. Yes. So it loses the point completely of like trust and like genuine authentic discussion. Yes. So usually I, I break the ice and say, look, uh, I'll go straight in it. So so we talk about it and so they after a while people know me, but it's it's actually how I am and how I communicate. Mm-hmm. So they know that it's the authentic self and not, I'm not trying, you know, some technique of manager, like right. my, you know, uh, sandwich technique, because people can spot it and then you lose even more of the trust and then yeah. the feedback comes even worse, you know, so. Right. Yeah. I, I think from, from my own experience, the way that I use a shit sandwich is depending on the level of experience. So if I'm working with someone very junior, yes. then mm-hmm. I'll shit sandwich the junior person. But if I'm working with somebody more experienced and I was just, it's just the shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And that's what they expect from you as well. But right. it's a really good point. I I also experienced in the past where um, I I forgot sometime with more junior uh, position to go a bit straight, you know, and, and, and that, that is also very depressing and damaging for them. So uh, I've, I learned also that way that it's important also to, to de- how to deliver and to who right. and based on the experience, definitely. Okay. And uh, conflicts is another thing, also part of the team. No one likes conflicts, but if there's no conflicts, and I know I've, I've observed team with no conflicts, then yeah, I just I believe that's part of my belief that then nobody talks about the hard things, and then you are not reaching the full potential of the ideas of what you are supposed to do. I want to come also remind like what starts before conflicts is uh, building the trust. I'll come back to that. Like, how do you build trust in the team? But Trust is just about time. You spend time with people, you get to know them in and out of the work, and then it makes things really easier here to start to have conflict. But if there's no trust, I don't expect the team to feel comfortable to have conflict. So that's also the pyramid like from the five dysfunction of a team uh, from the book that I'm going through when I form a team. And for them to be aware that that's normal, that they are not there yet because they just started to work together. So uh, getting to know each other is, I would say, more important at the beginning. And yeah, the conflicts in one-on-one, uh, my way of dealing with that, usually I like people to handle the conflicts. So I, I don't want to be as the lead, uh, the person resolving the conflicts. So I make it clear as well for them that they have to learn to talk about the hard things and you know go through it. So I can advise on the side, each of them, how they can handle it, but I don't intervene. And only at the, as the last resort, it, I, it hasn't happened too much, but I would intervene to help and uh, come as a moderator of the discussion. But otherwise, everybody as adults can, you know, have conflicts. Um, and that's what I want also uh, to value in the team. Another thing is like the respect and care. That is one also of my values in the culture of the team. Uh, why I hide it importantly, it's easy to be uh, carried away with um, working on games and the pressure it has. I mean, it's a very competitive market. In an organization, they repeat a lot of time the goals and you need to deliver and so on. So everybody wants to do great. And I've seen some situation where people also are at the worst when they're under stress and pressure. So I want to remind us uh, as a team that we are here for each other. We are, we are doing our best, you know, and we are here as humans. So uh, for me, behind the professional, they are humans, and I really care. And I would never push it to just for the performance and results to put people in bad uh, condition or health. And this is a fundamental also values for me inside the team. Yeah, there's actually a quote that I like to tell a lot of the teams that I work with is that there's this famous John Wooden quote, which basically says, you can disagree without being disagreeable, right? And so like, you need to have that conflict, you need to have that discussion, debate, but you don't need to like yell and scream and hate each other. Exactly. So it's about respect of individuals. And I don't like the talks in the back. So that's also something I really foster in the team when there's issues, you talk about it, you're responsible. So if I see that kind of behavior, I would also say something because you are the problem if you don't talk about the problem at some point. Yeah. But I spent some time as well to uh, set the expectation here of what I would expect as behavior inside the team. 
Another part is about interview and hiring. I've seen also like in teams, we think that uh, it's the responsibility only of the lead supervisor and HR. For me, it's the responsibility of the, of the team as a whole. So I want the team to be involved in the hiring because this is for me the critical factor of success of the game. Uh, yes, we can have a great design and uh, one great uh, talent and genius, but that's not enough. What does that mean for a team being involved? So it's being prepared for the interview. So also give like instruction. How do you prepare for the interview? What to expect to look at? Um, thinking also of a team fit and complementary and going through, you know, all the things. I've seen a lot of interview without preparation where people like just print last minute the CV and go in the room and interview at the same time. It's not great for the candidate uh, as well to see that somebody is not up to date with their profile. And uh, it's not great as well for preparation to know if it's a good candidate or not. So having people prepared for the interview. And like here, I give a lot of also tips on how to conduct an interview, what kind of question you should ask, what kind of question you shouldn't ask. So I, like, I, I just wanted to go through here. So I remind as well like the do's and don'ts for questions, the red flags of candidates they can see, observe in behavior, and what type of questions they can ask but usually it's open-ended questions. There are different parts about values, culture, hobbies, and skills, team player, growth mindset. And uh, usually for questions, I like it to be situational, contextual, and open, so not leading questions. But that takes some training for people to be able to interview. So then, um, I jump on the part of workflow here call uh, intentionally not as processes. Why? Because I want minimum process in the team for the reasons as well that it's changing a lot. It's very depending on team, on individuals. So I don't want to impose anything here. However, if we have less process, that means that we have a lot of structured thinking in how we do things and in a more systemic way. And we have a very um, good communication and clarity of the processes. And what does that mean? Then. If we add processes, we question why, what value it adds to our results. So I don't, I don't want to end up as a team to spend time managing the process, which becomes a thing at some point where you have too many processes instead of making the game. Yep. So it's, uh, being mindful about what makes sense and what doesn't at this point. And um, in terms of communication, we have to share a lot and we have to clarify who does what. So that's also the curse of a team when we are ownership and minimum processes in this clarity of who are, what are the responsibility. Yeah, and I don't know if you've read the Amazon shareholder letter entitled Day One by Jeff Bezos, yeah. but like, you know, just the importance of not only, there, there's definitely an importance to process, but there's also, it's equally important to know when to ignore the process. And so I think you're, the approach you're taking is, is actually great. Yeah. And I, I was amazed by that letter was very, very rigorous and very, you know, and there was a lot of details into that uh, then uh, as, a, as opposite to processes. Um, then uh, when you don't have processes or less, then it means always improving. So questioning what we are doing and revisiting and stop what doesn't work and move on. Then meetings is part of the processes. And even that is really important for me I've been in organization as well, without mentioning them, where I could spend my whole days in meeting. And that's oh, not yeah. fair. <laughs> and and uh, then you have, need a day to recover from that. So no, life is too short to spend it in meetings. We, we talked about that the other yeah, day. We yeah, we did. And I, you know, it's like 90% of execs and the higher you go, all they do is like, you know, 10 to five meetings and then they go home and like, it's like, what have you done? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yes, uh, and uh, I, I, I've, I've, I spent some time thinking like wh why, why does it slip to that at some point and why does it happen? Um, and I think it's like, again, when you are not revisiting what you're doing or questioning, yes. then you just follow the habit and then everybody goes to meeting without questioning it. So I want us as a team to question the need of meeting. And what does that mean? So I don't accept any meeting that don't have agenda and goals. And that is like a requirement for anyone in the team who wants to organize meeting. You have a goal of that meeting and who is really needed in that meeting. So most of the time, so everyone is invited and I see people on their cell phone or on their laptop doing something else. Invite really the people who should be part of the discussion that should happen in a meeting. Otherwise, the rest, they can be updated uh, later 
through documentation or just you know a slack line or whatever any text preparation briefing materials and time box respecting the time i find as well people don't know how to do that it's very easy you put a timer on the phone and then you have different topics to cover in a certain time and you respect the time of others but it, in his organization cell phone use uh, so i made it like as a rule here i have to think if that's one that works the thing is that we have a tendency and it's like a general thing to spend our time on phones without even noticing it or thinking about it. So I want to test how are we capable as a group of humans to be focused attention on, on, on something without being browsing on our phone. So I would like us to be able to be present in yeah. the discussion, but I'll see how realistic it is if it's too hard for people to be away from the phone, but I would like to try it. Yeah, I, I would say that in a lot of organizations where meetings aren't conducted very efficiently, that this part for me is a little bit, it depends on the organization you're part of, right? So if you're in a highly efficient organization where meetings are extremely well structured, I would say this works. But then if you're forced to be in a lot of meetings, yeah. which are useless, then, you, then you yeah. know, that's when you see like half the people on their laptops doing yeah. other work because the meetings are just... And then one other point I would make is like, uh, I, I think that, you know, time boxing and making sure that the meeting is on track is important, but then I would also just assign an owner to it, right? Like the yeah. meeting, the, whoever calls the meeting should be responsible for setting the agenda and, and then like drive, making sure that the, that the meeting is on time. And, you know, if, if you have to go over time that, that you inform other people and all that kind of stuff, but, um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, this, this is great. I actually wrote my own version of, of, of this. Yeah, from, awesome. You know, yeah. I'd be happy yeah, to share that with yeah. you, but it's very, very similar. So <laughs> I think we have suffered of too much time sitting in meetings. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we had to do something about it. And moderation also is something that I notice especially in brainstorm meeting or when you we are we have as a small group have to solve a problem. Uh, it's more like a, a lack of awareness. But the host doesn't let everyone participate. So it's like also how to uh, make sure that even the people who are not vocal, it's not because they don't have anything to say, but they maybe are not comfortable to speak up, to give the chance for everyone to participate. Because everyone has good ideas in general. But yeah, there's always some that are more comfortable to speak up. And then wrapping up. Basic things about meeting, but it's good to remind about them. But I, I want to be quite strict about that because I don't want us to spend too much time on meeting, especially when we are five. It doesn't make sense. So, um, and then the last part, like I, I, I've seen also from uh, the deck you shared with me the other day about area of responsibility. So yeah. I, I, I believe that everyone participates in the making and success of a game. Definitely. That doesn't mean that everyone has to agree and decide on every aspect of a game. It's for time efficiency and it's just doesn't make sense for certain area of expertise and responsibility. So how to uh, deal with that? It's about defining who are the owners of what, and not only who are the owners, but what being an owner implies. It has different levels of decision. I wanted to show here something I started to build. So it's an example, but I, I, I would use it as a tool with the team to uh, discuss what are the areas of responsibility? Who is the owner of certain tasks and parts? So like for me, it's the product vision and, and the team, but on the design would be a designer, art and so on. And what is the level of decision? Which are the ones that they are ground rules and like no debate, it's just as is. Which ones are to sell? Which one are needs participation of others? Which one are to agree and delegate? The reason why there's nothing here it's because I, it's based on the owners. So instead of me delegating decision on others, here it has different owners. But I want uh, to try it out with the team and use it to discuss. So then we are clear about decision that can be made really fast and decision that needs actually consultation from others. But for example, the ones that I uh, believe that are start with me, is, uh, for example, the target audience, because I would I'd be the first one to look into the market from a product perspective, what makes sense in terms of business goals. So, But I, I don't have to impose it. I will have to sell and convince the team this is the way to go. And of course, taking the feedback, but I that's my ultimate decision. But uh, on other parts, for example, when it's a team things, then I would say work hours, flexible time, it's more something that is ground rules, but others are more flexible and holiday team events, who to hire, you know, so 
this is something uh, to discuss as a team. When it comes to vision, design vision and our vision, I believe it's more of a art leader, a redesigner to sell it to the rest of the team and so on. But this is a work in progress document. Yeah, I have a similar table, although mine's a, it's, it's a lot simpler. I, I just basically have who the owner is, who needs to be consulted, who needs to be informed. And then one other nuance is there's a lot of teams out there who actually split up responsibility and accountability. And I think that's a big mistake. Mm. Like, you know, if you have some big boss that's like, okay, I made this call. Now you have to do it. And if it screws up, you're, you're, you know, you're accountable. I, I think that's such nonsense. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it happens at so many organizations that, yeah. um, anyway, but yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think like from the moment you say you're the owner, uh, to me, it's very clear you're responsible for the result. So, so that's, that's I, I think, you know, the, the current sort of Silicon Valley meme is around combining responsibility and accountability, but you would be surprised at how many organizations outside of Silicon Valley split that up. And it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, in, in my opinion. Yeah, so it, it needs to be like checked, I guess. It's not just, yeah. Uh, reminding I mean it's it's nice to have the freedom without the responsibility right but yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you take all the risk I take all the credit yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> like, nonsense <laughs> but uh, this is when people are responsible then they are paying attention to the decision and they are consulting because yeah. they know that they may not have the ultimate truth alone yeah. so I want people to be responsible so the decision or the risk they are taking and uh, my last part is like the part that uh, I I would say I enjoy it the most because this is, uh, I love, that's why I love to build teams as well, uh, how to nurture and foster creativity. And for me, it comes down to several things that are very simple, allowing flexible work. I mean, these days it's very common in tech. People work uh, differently and have this creativity or you know the, the brain active in different times of the day. There's actually a thing that people are more active in the morning or in the evening. I want to allow that to happen if they need uh, in different places and different times. So uh, like here I make some basic rules about wh what is the same time we need to work together. I even like mentioned an afternoon nap. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> but I, I, I've seen a situation where everybody has a food coma after lunch and like dragging that on on the afternoon is not very you know helpful. So sometimes just helping people to recover, I'm fine as well with that. So I'm very flexible about that. I believe a lot in that and remote work, I want to allow it as in the team. So these are ground rules that I share openly with the team uh, to use and enjoy. And holidays is very important for me. So I want people to make time for themselves and respect the time. So I don't want any email or uh, communication during the weekend. Of course, we can read to each other about casual things, but no work on the weekend. And I, I, that's something I will enforce because over time, people tired at work it doesn't help anyone. So. This needs a bit of a help also from my side. And uh, I believe also a lot in um, that, that we are not just workers, but we are humans. So what does that mean? It's um, dedicating a lot of time where I will build these things around for us to get to know each other. Because as I said, like working together as a team to be comfortable having conflicts in his trust. And for that, we need to know each other. And uh, creativity and uh, R&D, this is um, a part that I will invest a lot as well. So making it more um, deliberate. So organizing organizing game jams, pitch days, uh, uh, free training days for teams, um, creative activities, so out of games, uh, leaving a lot of creative projects. And when we will be in Berlin, I want also us as a team to be open to meet other teams. So I, I'm quite connected in Berlin and I will organize that with other studios that we get to meet other teams that are open enough to see how others are working to inspire also our own way of working. But having the team being able to uh, see what's outside. So th this is a work in progress part, but I, I do care a lot about that as well to help uh, the team. And uh, then that's it. The last part is just when I will present it to have uh, a new um, team formed, uh, then it's a living document and one that needs feedback, iteration based on what resonates to them, what doesn't. And I was, uh, uh, for the last uh, part, I wanted just to share like, actually I was like taking inspiration on other companies that have a pretty um, detailed handbook. I'm not doing an organization handbook, so that's why it's not that long. So I'm doing a team handbook. 
But uh, I found, um, if I manage to open it, I found actually a really interesting way how other companies have done it. So Trello is making a Trello handbook, which is super cute. Um, Netflix has, a, for example, some slide shares. So yeah. I was thinking for my own case, I may ask the team when we are formed to do it as a game jam, to create a game out of it. We make a handbook as a game. <laughs> I imagine a little character that goes yeah. through levels, and when you unlock the level, you see you know, some of the principle, or you see in the sky in the background as you play through the level, but it could be a game for the team to make a game handbook. So this is more of the content you have seen, okay. but I would like to make it more playful. Great. Yeah, no, I think this is great. And uh, I, I definitely think that, you know, I, I think you would be surprised at how few leaders actually establish this, this type of, you know, document, codify and communicate the kind of values and, and sort of principles as far as, you know, how a team should be working together. And so I, I think this is fantastic. And, you know, very surprisingly, you know, I, maybe not so surprisingly, because, you know, we, it seems like just talking to you, we read a lot of the same books and things like that. And I, I would say that in terms of what you've presented, I mean, I agree with, with almost everything. I would say the one part that I, I'm a little bit different from you on is the holidays and time off. I think mm -hmm. that kind of depends on your situational context and, you know, kind of what you're trying to accomplish and things like that. So I'm a little bit more hardcore <laughs> on that side, but um, besides that, you know, I, um, you know, definitely a lot of alignment with, with myself. And I, I, I really feel that the way that you're approaching things is, is fundamentally extremely sound. So that, you know, thank you very much for sharing. And um, I, I think what you've done is, is, is really great. Yeah, thanks. And I hope it's helpful for others to make their own handbook, a uh, team handbook yeah, and carry sure. around with it with their teams. And if any, uh, you know, feedback for up, they can uh, contact me as well for feedback. Um, it's a working, uh, working progress document, living document. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the, you know, to, to that point, I think that's like one of the most important steps is to actually have a handbook because right now so many teams are operating in vacuums, right? And they're just like talking to each other. They're just kind of assuming stuff. Everyone's got a different idea of, of how their team is actually working, but to write it down, to, to communicate it, to go through it, then that helps align teams in a much stronger way. But very few teams and very few leaders actually take the initiative to do this. And so I, from that perspective, I think it's, it's uh, again, really great. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, I will let you know after I experiment uh, with the next team. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.